Today we will be solving this problem called counting coprime pairs. So we are given a list of n positive integers and our task is to count the number of pairs of integers that are coprime, i.e. their greatest common divisor is 1. So the first line of our input will contain one integer up to 10 to the fifth, then we'll follow n integers up to 10 to the sixth. And the answer is the number of pairs that are coprime. So let's head to the drawing board to solve this problem. So as we said, we will be given an array of some size. And we need to find the number of pairs ij such that the GCD of i and j is equal to 1. So let's analyze what we need to find here. So we need to find some number of pairs and these pairs satisfy some property involving the GCD. So the first part here is to find the, the number of pairs. And let's consider a broader example, like suppose we have the following example. We have four elements and they are just all ones. And since the GCD of one and one is one, then any pair here is valid. So the answer here will be just the total number of possible pairs. So a good starting point would be to see what is the upper value for this. Uh, otherwise, what is the total number of pairs we can form in any given array? And this is not too hard to find. So we need to find two indices i and j. So first we choose some value for i and we have four choices here. So we have four choices for the first value. Then when the first value is picked, say this value, we only have three choices left. So the all possible pairs will be four times three. But we have to notice something here. For example, if we pick this first, so the first value will be three. And say we pick this value second, so the second value will be four. Another possibility that we counted here is that we pick this value first, then we pick this value. So this pair would be represented with four and three. And in this total, we counted both of these. But since we are dealing with unordered pairs here, we have to count these only once, not twice as we did. So that's why we divide this by two, since each uh, unordered pair is counted twice. And this is precisely equal to C4 choose 2. So we are choosing two elements from four elements. And the general formula for this is the following. So if we're going to choose A elements from B elements, then the number of ways of doing so is B factorial over A factorial times B minus A factorial. And the numerator here is also special. Remember what we counted first here were all possible pairs where order mattered. And when the order matters, we note this with P. And we say that, for example, this would be equal to P choosing two from four. So if we choose two elements from four elements and the order matters, then this is equal to four times three over two. And in general, P of choosing A from B is equal to B factorial over B minus A factorial. And we can see that these two formulae are related. Namely, we have that P of AB is equal to A factorial times C of AB. And this makes sense because these are all possible pairs or all possible tuples of A elements from B where their order does not matter. So if the order matters, then we have to account for each permutation of these A elements in the tuple. For example, if we picked one, three, four, with respect to this C, this is identical to three, one, four. But with respect to P, it isn't. So this object here contains all tuples and order doesn't matter. So it only contains one copy of each tuple. So to generate all copies where order matters, 
we just have to find all permutations of these A elements and they are precisely A factorial such permutations. So this takes care of this first part and we now know that the total number of pairs is equal to n times n minus 1 over 2. Now let's move on to the second part here. Oh, I apologize, here I should have ai and aj. So as we know, the GCD of two numbers is equal to 1 if there is no number that divides both ai and aj. But what is more important here is that this property is binary meaning that it is either true or false. And this fact will allow us to rephrase our goal here. So we are looking for the number of pairs i and j such that their GCD is equal to 1. And this is actually equal to another quantity. Namely, this is equal to the complementary of this. And that would be n times n minus 1 over 2. Namely, all the pairs we have minus the number of pairs i and j such that their GCD is different from 1. So this is similar to probabilities. For example, the probability of something happening is 1 minus the probability of something not happening. If you know the probability, if you only have two outcomes and you know the probability of one, you can deduce the probability of the other by subtracting it from one. And one here represents the whole possible value as does n times n minus one over two here. So is this reformulation useful? I mean, how do we know that this would be easier to calculate than this. Maybe finding this would be easier. We don't know. Let's just keep this in mind and delve deeper into what does the GCD represents. So as we said, the GCD of two numbers x and y is equal to d implies that d divides x and d divides y. And the right of the bat, this formulation should reassure us about what we just discovered above here. So if you want to prove that the GCD of two numbers is equal to one, uh, the first idea that comes to mind is to go through all these here and see that none of them divides both A and AI and AJ. Whereas we could look at this problem backwards. We could actually see which pairs have the divisor D instead of checking if d divides both these, can we actually go backwards and check which pairs divide x and y? And if we were to categorize these pairs based on which numbers divides them, this reformulation of the problem would become easier. But I understand that this is not too clear at the moment. That's why we have to delve deeper into this problem. So let's start. The first pair is 5 and 4. So the GCD of 5 and 4 is 1. 5 and 20 is 5. 5 and 1 is 1. 5 and 16 is 1. 5 and 10 is 5. And finally, 5 and 8 is 1. So all pairs of 5 with all other numbers except 20 and 10 are valid. Now let's move on to 4. So the GCD of 4 and 20 is 4, the GCD of 4 and 1 is 1, the GCD of 4 and 16 is 4, the GCD of 4 and 10 is 2, and the GCD of 4 and 8 is 4. Next, the GCD of 20 and 1 is 1, 20 and 16 is 4, 20 and 10 is 10, 20 and 8 is actually 4. And for 1, its GCD is 1 with all numbers. The GCD of 16 and 10 is 2, and 16 and 8 is 8. And finally, the GCD of 10 and 8 is 2. So these are the GCDs of all pairs. Now let's see what values we got. So I'm not going to highlight the ones because we actually want to approach the problem with the second approach we described. So we have 4 here, 
we have a bunch of fours. We have a few fives here. That's it. We have uh, three twos. We have one eight. And we have a ten here. So as you can see here, we have five categories. And this does not seem to help us much. Is there anything we can notice here? So is there any way we can reduce these categories to something more compact, something smaller, fewer categories? So what does this mean? It means that 4 divides both 4 and 8. And this means that 2 divides both 4 and 10. And what we are most concerned about is that these two values are different from 1. We don't want 1. And these two values are different from 1 because, as we said, a number divides these two numbers. But more precisely, these two values are different from 1 because there is a prime number that divides both 4 and 10 and 4 and 8. And this prime number is 2. And it is the same prime for both these values. So if we actually seek to specify what is the actual GCD values of each pair, we will have too many categories. And what we are interested in uh, the most is just that these values are different from one. So maybe it would be a good idea to actually just mark down the prime numbers that divide each pair. So here, there is only one, which is five, the same here. Here, instead of four, we will just mark two because two is the only prime number that divides both four and 20. Here also we'll have just two. So here we already had two. Here also we'll just have two. Two here. But here notice, there are actually two prime numbers that divide both 20 and 10. And these are 2 and 5. 4 here will be just reduced to 2. Here we already have 2. This 8 will become 2 as well. And now we only have 3 categories. So with all these new 2 values, all the, all the GCDs that were of the form 2 raised to some power just got collapsed into the same category. And we have a new emerging category here that contains more than one prime number. And if you look at it for a while, this is reminiscent of a problem we already saw. Once we were given a, a number n, say a hundred, and we were asked to find the number of elements that are divided by both two and five. So the numbers that are divided by 2 are actually equal to 50 and we get this by dividing 100 by 2 and the number of elements that are divisible by 5 is actually equal to 20 which is 100 divided by 5 so the number of elements that are divided by, by both 2 and 5 would be equal to 70, wouldn't it? But as we saw this was not correct because we actually count some elements twice, namely 10 is counted twice because we count it once as a divisor, as a multiply, because we count it once as a multiplier of two and once again as a multiplier of five. So in that problem, we use the inclusion exclusion principle to count the numbers that are divisible by two and five without counting twice. And if you think about it, this is very similar to this problem. But let's not get ahead of, of ourselves. I will put a link to this problem as well as to its editorial in the description box. And now let's get back to our problem. So all these numbers that have 2 as a prime divisor of their GCD can be generated really easily. If we go through all these numbers and see the ones that are divisible by 2, we would find 4, 20, 16, 10, and 8. And if we pick any pair of these elements, then they would have a 2 as a prime divisors of their GCD. For example, here 10 and 20, it has a 2. 10 and 8, it also has a 2 here. 
And the same applies for 5. So the numbers that are divisible by 5 are 5, 20, and 10. And each pair here has 5 as a prime divisor of its GCD, like 5 and 10 and 5 and 20. So if we are able to generate this array that represents all the numbers that are divisible by 2, and all the numbers that are divisible by 5, and all the numbers that are divisible by both 2 and 5, here we would have 10 and 20, then using the inclusion-exclusion principle, we would know the total number of pairs that have a GCD difference from 1. So here, what is the total number of pairs that have a GCD that is divisible by 2? So here we have 5 elements and we can pick 2 from them. So that would be equal to C5 choose 2. We are choosing 2 elements from 5 elements. And this would be equal to 10. And here the number of pairs that has 5 as a prime divisor of their GCD would be equal to 3 choose 2. And this would be equal to 3. And finally, the number of pairs that has both 2 and 5 as a prime divisor of their GCD would be equal to C2 choose 2. And this is just equal to 1. And using the inclusion-exclusion principle, here we only have one element, so we're going to add that to the answer. Here we also have just one element, so we're going to add that to the answer. And here, since we have two, we're going to subtract that from the answer. If the number of elements is odd, we add it to the answer. If it is even, we subtract it from the answer. So our answer here would be 10 plus 3 minus 1, which is equal to 12. So there are 12 pairs whose GCD is different from 1. And if we count here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And since we know that all the elements, and since we have 7 elements here, and we know that the total sum of all elements would be equal to 21, then our answer would be just 21 minus 12. So the only challenge now is to generate this array, or as we saw, we are not very interested in the elements that are present in this array. We just want to know uh, the number of elements. We don't care about their actual value. So for each prime or for each combination of primes, we would like to know how many numbers from our array has that combination as a divisor. And there is actually an algorithm that we saw earlier that would help us do that, and that was the sieve of Eratosthenes. So this sieve allows us to generate prime numbers, but it also allows us to factor numbers or a range of numbers in n log n. So if we have numbers from 1 to n, and we want to factor all of them, we can do that in n of in n log n. And in this example, our numbers are only up to a million, so we can use this procedure to factor all these numbers instead of going through each one of them and actually computing its factors using the generic algorithm in all of square root of n that would lead to a total complexity of n square root of n. Instead, we can achieve a way better performance using the sieve. But how does it work? So I went ahead and listed all the numbers from 1 to 20. I also highlighted the, the numbers present in my array in blue. And the algorithm proceeds this way. We start from 2. And since 2 was not visited before, we know that 2 is a prime number. And we start making jumps of 2. So we know that 2 divides 4 as well, so we're going to add it as one of its divisors. Then we're going to jump by 2, so 2 divides 6 as well, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. Now we move our pointer, 
we are at 3 now so 3 was not visited before so we know it is a prime number as well and we gonna start making jumps as we did previously but this time jumps of 3 so 3 divides 6 and divides 9 divides 12 divides 15 divides 18 and that's it we keep going we're not gonna put our pointer on 4 now because it was already visited so we move to 5 our next prime so let's just put 5 here I forgot to put 2 and 3 here so 5 here and we're gonna make a jump of 5 so I'm gonna put 5 here again 5 here again and finally 5 here I will increase my pointer to 6 but it was already visited so I'm just gonna move it to 7 so I'm at 7 now and 7 divides 7 and it also divides 14 now I'm gonna jump all the way to 11 so 11 and 13 and 17 and 19 only divides themselves because their second multiplier 22 here will be larger than 20 so if for each value here I keep a vector of its prime divisors then I am almost done I can just look through the values I have so 1 does not have any prime divisor so it's not gonna contribute anything I will move on to 4 I know that 2 is a prime that divides 4 so I, I need to keep an array as we saw here that keeps track of the number of elements that have 2 as a prime factor of their GCD so I'll just call this array A and A of some value X represents the number of elements divisible by X so since 2 divides 4 I'm gonna increment A of 2 so A of 2 becomes 1 and I will move on to the next element in my array 5 and it is divisible by 5 so I'm gonna increment A of 5 with 1 I'll move on to 8 8 is divisible by 2 so I'm gonna increment the A of 2 with 1 and I'll move on to 10 and here notice I have something very special so 10 has two prime factors and it can contribute to either 2 or 5 or both of them so basically we need to run through all possible subsets of the prime divisors for all elements so if we have n elements we would have to go through 2 to the n subsets so for 10 it will contribute once to a of 2 it will also contribute once to a of 5 and it will also contribute once to a of 10 which is 2 times 5 and since in the inclusion exclusion principle we require to know the number of primes that went into this combination let's introduce an array b and b of x represents the number of primes that divide x so b of 10 here will be equal to 2 and b of 2 and b of 5 will just be equal to 1 now we move on to 16 so we did 10 and now we are at 16 it has only one prime factor so we're just gonna increment this by one and finally we have 20 it has two prime factors as well so we need to go through all subsets so it's gonna increment a2 it's gonna increment a5 and it's also gonna increment a10 and to clarify this better let's suppose that 30 was an element of our array so 30 has three prime factors 2 3 and 5 and in this case we will need to generate all subsets so generate 2 3 5 2 5 2 3 3 5 and finally 2 3 5 so that would give us 2 3 5 10 this was 2 3 so 6 15 and 30 and for each one of these we would increment its value in a and we will also note how many 
uh, prime factors it consists of in B. And if you're not familiar about generating subsets, we can do that using the binary representation of these numbers. So we have three elements here. And if we count from zero up to two to the third, meaning from zero to eight, we will have the following. So we have zero, one, 10, 11, 100, 101, 110, and 111. And this is actually equal to seven. So each bit in our binary representation corresponds to an element here. And each mask here tells us which elements to pick. So here we won't pick any element. Here we will just pick five. Here we will pick three. Here we will pick three and five. Here we'll pick two, here we'll pick two and five, here two and three, and finally two, three, and five. And you can see that we got exactly the same result as here. So to sum up, we're gonna use the sieve to find the prime factors of all numbers. Then we're gonna go through the elements of our array. And for each element, we're going to generate all the subsets of its prime factors. And for each subset, we're going to increment the value in A. And we're going to also mark how many prime factors it contains in B. And at the very end, we're just going to look through our array A. And for each value, we're going to check whether its corresponding value in B is odd or even. If it is odd, we're going to add it. And if it is even, we're going to subtract it. If this does not seem clear, it is probably because you're not familiar with the inclusion exclusion principle. So I invite you to check out the video I put in the description box. So before moving on to the code, a word about complexity here. We said that the complexity for the sieve was n log n. And we may have to go up to a million. So the complexity here will be a million log a million. Plus, as we said, for each element in our array, and we may have n elements, we will generate all the subsets of its prime factors. And the interesting thing here is that it cannot have too many distinct prime factors because they grow really fast. We can have at most seven prime divisors because the smallest number that has seven prime divisors would be two times three times five all the way up to 17. And this is about half a million. So anything bigger than that would go beyond a million. So we only have seven numbers and we would generate all their subsets in two raised to the seven. So the total complexity here would be n times two to the seventh which is equal to 128 and n is equal to 10 to the 5. So this is about 10 to the 7, which means we are within our threshold. So that's pretty much it. Now let's move on to the code. So this is our program. We will start by reading n. Then we will declare a vector of ints of size n that we will call values. Then we will read our values. Then we will perform our sieve algorithm. So I declare a vector of ints of size max value, and this max value is set to a million and ten, just some buffer, just in case. I will also need a vector of vector of ints that will store for each value its divisors. So I will look through all values from two up to max value. And if some value does not have any divisors so far, so if the divisors of i is equal to zero, I mean its size is equal to zero, then I know that this i is a prime number. So if that's the case, I'm gonna push i as a divisor of itself, then I'm gonna start making jumps of size i starting from 2i, and for each value I land on, I will insert i as a divisor of j. So that's it for the sieve. Now I will declare two vectors, 
when uh, these vectors were the vectors a and b that we talked about here. So the first vector is the number of values that are divisible by any value. And the second vector corresponds to the number of prime divisors of any value. Next, I will look through all my values from 0 to n. And for each value, I will generate all the subsets as we saw here. And I will use bit masks as we described here. Since the first bit mask does not have any ones turned on, so I'll just ignore it and start from 1. And I will go all the way up to 2 to the n, where n is the number of prime divisors. So that's what I did here. So for mask equals 1, mask up to 1 shifted by the size of the divisors. And the shift here is just exponentiation by 2. And for each mask, I calculate two things. The first thing is this combination, meaning the products of the primes that are lit in this mask. And the second is the number of prime divisors for this mask. Next, I will look through all possible positions from 0 up to the number of divisors. And for each position, I will check if it is on by ending one shifted by pause with the mask. If that uh, if the, the bit at position is on, then this end will not be equal to 0. And in this case, I will add this prime to the combination by multiplying it, and I will increment the prime divisors. Next, I will just increment the number of values divisible by this combination because I just found one, and I will also mark the prime divisors of this combination with the prime divisors count that I just calculated. So we are done with that. Now all what we have to do is calculate the final answer. So as we said, we're going to calculate its complement instead. So first we calculate the total number of pairs. And we saw that that was equal to n times n minus 1 over 2. This. And since n can be as large as 10 to the 5th, and we are performing a product of two numbers that can be as large as 10 to the 5th, this may be as large as 10 to the 10th, which may overflow int. That's why I'm using long long here, and I'm casting this to long long. And the second thing I need to calculate is the number of valid pairs, meaning the pairs that have a GCD larger than 1. And to calculate those, as we said, we, we are just gonna go through the number of elements that are divisible by each combination of prime and we're just gonna choose two elements from this and the formula we're gonna use is again n times n minus 1 over 2. But as we said, we're gonna have two cases here. If the number of prime divisors is odd, we're gonna add that contribution to the answer and if it is even, we're going to subtract it from the answer. So if the number of prime divisors for i is odd, then we're going to add uh, the values divisible by i times the values divisible by i minus 1 over 2. Otherwise, we're going to subtract it. And at the end, we're just going to print the difference of those two values. So that's pretty much it. Let's go ahead and submit. So that worked. Thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video. Bye bye.